It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to worship the Lord, even on the Lord's Day evening, as a, kind of the crescendo, the close of the day. So, um, anyways, with that said, let's go to the book of 1 John as we try to finish what we started last week. We're going to try to make it through three chapters, so we've really got to keep the pace, you could say. So... First John, and we're going to start in chapter three because we ended at the the end of chapter two is where we that's where we stopped. That was our, uh, our final point. Thankfully, we did get to a good stopping point with the chapter break right there. Um, but this one, likewise, uh, like I said, we have a lot. Chapter three's got a lot in it. Chapter four, chapter five, as you can if you can even see it on your Bibles, it takes up multiple pages. So we'll try to get through as much as we can, and hopefully make it to the end um, this evening in the time that's been allotted for our time together. For this time of teaching. So before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking that he would bless his word. Father, we thank you again once more for bringing us together this evening at the appointed hour, uh, on the appointed day to worship you. And uh, I pray as we, we take this time together to have a little bit more of an informal time of um, the word being brought, but the word nonetheless being preached, I pray that it would go forth in power. Father, I pray that souls are convicted, that we are we are blessed as a result of these truths, we know that what's contained in this book, in the book of 1 John, is for our benefit. It is for our good. And so may we see it that way, and may we uh, react to the teaching of this book in such a manner as that. May our joy, as, a, as it says in Scripture, may be made complete. May that be true for us, Father. And we pray that Christ our Lord is, is uh, who gets our attention this evening, who is the recipient of our gaze, who is the object of our gaze, and uh, in whom uh, we delight. We pray that He is glorified in us, and uh, we, for we know that in Him we are saved. We are saved from the wrath which is to come, and we are grateful for that. So we pray He's glorified now in this time. It's in His name we offer these petitions, and we offer thanksgiving to you. Alrighty, uh, last week in the chapters 1 and 2 of the book of 1 John, we saw um, the Apostle John already, even from the beginning of the book, establish that um, this teaching about true and false conversion, in fact, that's the title of this sermon, True and False Conversion Part 2. It's the second part of that, because there's more to it. The, the, the whole book is concerned with that one subject of true and false Christianity, true and false religion. Um, and I even mentioned last week in, in the introduction to the sermon that uh, we observe around us in the, in the world many people who profess to be followers of Jesus. I mentioned even the fallaway rate that's discussed in a lot of Christian circles about children who are raised up in the church and they depart from the faith. And we wonder and we ask ourselves, what's the cause of that? And the cause is illegitimate conversion, illegitimate Christianity, false conversion. And it's prevalent Today And the teaching on it, though, is not so much, is not so much uh, heard of. And unfortunately, even though God in his providence has ordered it that whole, an entire book of the Bible would be given to that subject, would be dedicated to that one topic, because it's an important topic. It's not something that uh, is tertiary. It's not something that's a secondary issue. It must be thrown off to the side. We know that it has chief importance because it touches every one of us, and it affects every one of us directly. Our standing before God is at stake, and that's why uh, we're instructed in Scripture, for example, by the Apostle Paul to examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. Uh, that's a practice that every Christian ought to cultivate, um, that, that we um, periodically find ourselves looking inward. You know, Scripture calls us to what? To look to Jesus. That's our primary focus is the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are times when we ought to say, okay, so if I'm looking to Jesus, there's going to be evidence of that. As the Apostle John says, as it says elsewhere in Scripture, uh, Jesus mentions in Matthew 7, you're going to bear good fruit. So now, in order to see whether that's true, the fruit is there, I'm going to look to myself for a moment and do some self-scrutiny, some self-heart surgery. And, and you've got to get sometimes with the scalpel and do some painful incisions. But however, in doing so, what do we find? We find the truth. And um, the truth, even though maybe unpleasant, for certain of us, uh, will set us free. This, these things, as, as I mentioned, we approach the subject sometimes with a uh, trepidation, with a fear in us, you know, because these things, you don't want to think about um, examining yourself and really questioning your own self, bringing yourself to, to testify about yourself. 
And um, however, it's important and it is for our good. It is for our good. In fact, we uh, know that God has ordered this to be written for our joy. Our joy to be made full in this life and ultimately for the life which is to come. Because salvation, assurance of salvation can be attained. Can be attained and it can be possessed. I mean, we think about, as I mentioned this Sunday morning, John Rogers, who was burned at the stake. I don't think he was doubting whether he was going to be saved. I mean, he had chief, he had a chief confidence in God. He had a chief confidence in God's promises. So we think about uh, my brother Daniel Corning. I don't think he's out there in India, you know, being beat and being uh, being possibly very close, or I, could, I should say, being brought very close to martyrdom itself for something that he's he's hoping he has. I think it's something he knows he has, and uh, we can have that same assurance, brethren. Um, day by day, that confidence, uh, the word confidence, Latin, confide, with faith. We, we can have that, and the essence of confidence is faith, ironically. So let us keep that in mind. Let us keep these things in mind as we go through here and we consider true and false conversion. And so let's do that now, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3. Apostle John, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. That's one of the themes that's already been brought to our attention today, or excuse me, as we've gone through this book, is the theme of love. We, find, we found it a lot in chapter 2 about loving the brethren, loving God. That's really what, when we examine ourselves, that's actually what we're searching for. You know, if you claim to believe in God, you ought to love Him. I mean, that, that's really what's, that's what the essence of this is, is love for God that's manifested by works. You know, works are like uh, road signs, we could say. They're merely there to point us to something else. And that's the actual love of God that, uh, if we're Christ, is in us. And that's, that's what the Apostle John is reminding us here. If you're in Christ, God has what? Has lavished love. Uh, he uses the term bestowed in the New American Standard. He's poured it out on his people in grace. And what is the result of that love? We are adopted. We are children of God. And we are heirs. Scripture says we are co-heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. And even says, for this reason, the world does not know us. Because why? It did not know him. And I mentioned that this morning even about persecution. Well, why are we persecuted? It's not really because of us. It's because of God. They hate God. We represent God. In fact, if we didn't represent God and we were like them, they'd love us. If we were of the world, the world would embrace us. But we are of God, brethren. We've been born of God. And therefore, we are His and we represent Him to a lost world, a world that is um, hostile toward Him. Verse 2, Beloved, we are now children, no, excuse me, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has, and everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as he is pure. Verse, and that's verse 3 there. Uh, that's one of my favorite verses. Right after I was converted, it was one of the first verses I memorized was that, was that passage. It's such a delight because that's, that is the essence of salvation. In the midst of um, the Apostle John telling us to look at, our evidence, look at the fruit in our lives, look at your works. Your works will prove your faith. We saw it in the book of James. James says the same thing. He says, all right, I'm going to show you my faith by my works. He said, and even, he even gives a challenge to the reader. He says, show me your faith without works. And basically saying it's impossible. You can't. So, but the Apostle John wants us to look at our works and to see uh, whether those works are legitimate, whether they are good works, uh, which evidence that you have faith in God, true saving faith. But in the midst of all this, he wants us to not lose sight of this fact that our salvation is by faith and works are the evidence of it. In fact, misunderstanding that, you'll get all Christianity wrong. That's how important this subject is. If you think of it like works complement, or I should say works, um, works reinforce your faith in the sense that if they weren't there, you couldn't have faith, then that's heresy. That's salvation by works. We don't believe that. We believe what? Man, a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. However, in the same breath, we also can say with the writers of Scripture that the evidence, the, the, act, the natural result of saving faith is a life of joyful, grateful obedience to God. And I even mentioned last week that that obedience does not come out of slavish fear, out of a fear of judgment, for that's legalism. We're going to see on Wednesday night, that's exactly what uh, Martin Luther 
lived many of the years of his life in, in miserable torture under was a system of, of, of legalism, believing if he didn't perform correctly, God would punish him. And then he did discover, wait, salvation is by grace. And he said he was born again of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he said in his testimony, he said the gates of heaven were as if it was as, it was as if the gates of heaven swung open uh, when he read Romans 117, when it says, for the righteous man shall live by faith, by faith. So, which is actually out of Habakkuk 2.4. Interesting. So the Apostle John recognizes this precious doctrine, sola fide, Latin for faith alone. It says this is, this is the gospel we believe, a gospel of grace. But that grace procures works. It brings about works. So very interesting dichotomy. And once you correctly understand it, it's not so much of an issue. It's just getting to that point. I mean, I remember when I was first converted, this was a struggle for me, something I wrestled with because I, um, I just didn't know much about it. And again, going back to this stuff just is not, is not often talked about in churches. And so you, as a new Christian, having grown up in church but having never had any instruction about this, I'm, I'm confused. But I do know, I, I remember at that point, uh, just immediately after being converted, I was like, I know this. If you say you're a Christian and you don't live like a Christian, you're a hypocrite. But I don't know how that I don't know how that fully parses out. I couldn't really articulate that theologically, but I do know that's the truth. Because I was a person who said I was Christian, but I lived as though Christ never gave me a law to obey. I lived as though God didn't exist. I was a practical atheist. That's, uh, I've heard that term used before. A practical atheist. And so, um, and so there's that. Let's continue. Verse four. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. That word practice is a very key word because we, we know this. As Christians, what, what are we going to, what do we ought to expect about ourselves? Paul even says this, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the chief den of sinners. I'm the king of sinners. I'm the sinner of sinners. Well, when, if you look at a crowd of sinners, I'm going to stick out. Even Paul says that as a Christian. And there's, there's a real sense in which even though we are born again and God has made us holy, harmless, undefiled, yet we can say on our best day, when we look at our hearts, we're horrified. And we're disgusted. We say, yes, I am the chief den of sinners. Because the things that come out of my heart, the things that come out of my mind, the things that come out of my flesh disgust me. How much more God, who is holy and whose taste, whose, whose standard concerning these things is far higher than mine. And so, but thankfully we know we are covered by Christ's righteousness. But the, 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 but the term practicing righteousness, that's so important, or practicing sin, or practicing uh, uh, unrighteousness, or whatever, you can throw it in a sentence. That's a key term, practice, or that, that, that word is very key. Because it's not that the, the, the born-again Christian is, is perfect, or is walking in perfection. There's even times where it's very skewed. There's times in our walks where we even, for a season, appear like we're not even a Christian at all because of sin in our lives. However... What? The, the main direction of our life is to walk, for the most part, in righteousness. That's the difference between the believer and the unbeliever. The unbeliever will walk, they will make a practice of sin. In fact, uh, we use this term in, in, in um, our daily vernacular in English when we talk about a doctor, a medical doctor. We say that they're, they've, they're opening up a medical practice. They're practicing medicine. And so likewise, when someone lives a life of habitual sin... And they delight in it. They're, they're, they're opening a sin practice, you could say. It's, it's something that they're, they're engaging in over and over and over without remorse. But also on the flip side, if you're born again, you're making a practice of righteousness. It's something that you're constantly engaging yourself in and you're pursuing. You're pursuing. It's your occupation. So that's key. In verse 5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Now, again, we, 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 we have to remember, and this is, this is why um, contextual Bible study is of the uttermost importance. Because if you were to take this verse out, wouldn't we all be pretty scared? It's like, oh man, uh, we all sin, so none of us are in him. However, we know, and we know John is not that forgetful that he forgot what he wrote in the first chapter. As he says, if we, we being Christians, confess our sins. And then he even says, well, he's faithful and righteous to forgive our sins. And then on top of that, before, he said, if you say that you have no sin, you're a liar. You deceive yourself and the truth isn't in you. So don't, don't, take, um, don't take him saying this is, uh, as, broad, as a broad stroke because we know that's not what he's intending. Rather, he's, say, he's wording it in this way to emphasize the point 
That when someone is born again, they walk in righteousness in such a way, it's almost as if they don't sin. There's that much of a radical, life-changing work of God in their life. There, 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 there's an aspect in which God so wonderfully changes somebody when they're saved. It's as if they don't sin. But we know that they do, certainly. Verse 7, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. You know what I think is so significant about that? those two verses there? is not what he says at the second half of verse 7 and verse 8. is what he says at the beginning of verse 7. Let no one deceive you. Or make sure, in the New American Standard, make sure no one deceives you. Do you know what he's saying? This is going to be a point that's controversial. This is going to be a point that people who claim to be Christians are not going to be comfortable with. This is going to be a doctrine that people who say they're Christians aren't going to want to hear, not going to want to teach. And so I said in our modern day, we don't hear this taught on because it's not a comfortable doctrine. It's not, a, it's not an ear-tickling doctrine. I mean... I told a friend uh, just this past weekend, I said, I didn't become a preacher, or uh, what did I say? So I didn't enter into the ministry for money. And if I did, I would not be preaching what I'm preaching. <laughs> I would be preaching, um, I, I, I would be preaching Joel Osteen type sermons, Stephen Furtick type sermons, and I'd be tickling your ears all day long until the t- cows come home. But um, I can't, you know, I cannot. I'm bound to the Word of God. I'm bound to only say what the Scriptures um, say. But with that said, there are many who aren't in in, in such a frame of mind and rather are in the business of tickling ears. And so you're not going to hear this. And it's unfortunately prevalent in so many American churches, especially. I mean, I even posed a question last week. Have you ever heard a sermon on 1 John or even just a sermon on this very doctrine, true and false conversion? Because before I was converted, I never did once. Never once. Never. And it's unfortunate because it's so important. So, so very important. And John recognizes this under the inspiration of the Spirit of God knows. He knows what's going to happen in history. He knows how controversial this truth is going to be. And so he inspires John to write this. Little children. And there's such an endearing aspect to that. Oh, he's like a father over this church. Little children, please, I plead with you. Don't let people do what? Deceive you. Don't let them them distract you from this. What's the simple truth? If you practice sin, guess what? tree is bad. If you practice holiness or righteousness, the tree is good. There's faith abiding in you, saving faith. And then at the end of verse, end of verse 8 is what we have next to read. It says, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And this even speaks to the fact as Christians, I mentioned this, we have times of disobedience. We have times uh, in which we stray. But guess what? We cannot continue in that that course of life. Because God, um, the book of Hebrews says that God, God chastens. Some translations say he disciplines those whom he loves. Um, God works in providential means, in, in providential ways, that when we fall off, And we stray, which we do and we will and we have, I have. He uses means. He uses um, the events of life, the the preaching of the word, um, prayer, perhaps even just an inward conviction over that sin. Many different means does God use to bring us and to to draw us back. Just like a father with their child, their son or daughter, when they stray and they disobey. The parent will lovingly bring that child back. But guess what? There oftentimes is is an... um, there is an inflicting of a punishment. There's an inflicting of a punishment. Even with the, with the Father, we're, we're not destined for wrath. Scripture says we're not objects of divine wrath. But the Father will allow us to uh, taste, as it were, um, the, uh, the aftertaste of sin, you could say. The, some of what uh, sin's effects are like. I think we can all speak, to, speak to, to the Lord allowing us to see some of those things and to realize sin isn't as sweet as it appears to be. And, uh, and so we find ourselves turning back to Him. But you know what that shows? That we are legitimate children. Because God doesn't go after unbelievers. That's why when we see um, the fall away rate, we see these children raised up in churches and they leave and they never to come back. And you watch over the years of their life, there's no act of providence to bring them back. They don't ever come back saying, oh, I was convicted by the sermon I heard or I was this or I was that or the Lord just really brought this upon, uh, heavy upon my mind and my heart or um, I had a car wreck and I just thought about my life or whatever. You don't hear it because they're not his. 
He doesn't concern himself with bringing them back because they're not his children. They're the devil's children, and they're engaged in the devil's activity. So uh, that, that's another fruit of conversion, that God works providentially in the life of the Christian in a very real and tangible way so that when they sin, they are drawn back to the Father. We see it in like the life of David. I think David's sin with Bathsheba is a good example. We're all familiar with it, and how God used Nathan the prophet to rebuke uh, David. God gave Nathan that, uh, that boldness to enter into the king's presence and to be, you know, you are the man. That was not something that was light, especially to the king, the king of Israel, God's anointed one. But uh, God used that act of providence to bring David back, to bring David back. So keep that in mind. Verse 10, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor anyone who does not love his brother. We've already seen that. One of the fruits of conversion is loving God's people, loving the saints. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. That's the first, first martyr for Christ. First martyr for the gospel. And by the way, the, the view, the, the, the idea of love that's, 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 that's being brought to our attention here is not what, our, what society would call love today. I, I was reading an, uh, a Facebook post by the, a friend of mine who does evangelism um, on various college campuses in Iowa. And he actually has a tract and it just says on the front, pride, and it has the gay pride flag behind it. And then on the other side of the tract is all the info, is, is the gospel tract, is the gospel message. And the tract actually, ironically, never talks about gay marriage in the tract. It only talks about pride. It's just about pride. And then it presents the gospel, tells people about Jesus, and invites them to come and to repent and believe on him. Excellent, excellent ministry. Anyways, he said that um, he said that he was harshly, and I even read the article written by uh, was one of the student news association or whatever, uh, just, just railing him and just, just very, very, very bigoted. You know, it's funny they call us bigots, but a very bigoted article, very, very, very unfair article and treatment of a dear brother. And um, and that's all I was doing, just handing out tracts on the campus. I wasn't even, <coughs> excuse me, my apologies. wasn't even <laughs> doing anything extra controversial, I guess you could say. But uh, that's the that's the state of the snowflakes these days in, in society. But um, all that to say, the the article made it seem, that they didn't expressly state it, but it was very much inferred that he was an illegitimate Christian and he was hateful in what he was doing. And you know what they're really saying is, you know what loving things to do is? Is not to, to come and be confront, uh, confrontational and to come and confront people about their sin. That's the world's idea. Okay, you're, you want to be a loving Christian? Just be quiet. Just be a moral person. Keep your faith to yourself. And just, just, just breeze on through life and the world won't give you much trouble. That's the world's idea of love. And that's hate. That's hateful. When Christians sit at home or Christians neglect to share the gospel with their neighbors, they're saying, go to hell. Go to hell, all of you unbelievers, because I don't care about you. In fact, I always say all the time when I'm opening up preaching, I say, people, if I hated you, I would just stay home. Like I'm on Saturday morning, we went out and I was like, it's a Saturday morning. I could be sleeping in. I mean, I don't want to be out here. It's cold. The wind is blowing. I'm, I'm going to blow my voice, and now I won't be able to go sing when I go home, you know, play my guitar for the next day and a half. This is not fun, but listen, I care, I care for you people. I, I love you. I don't want you to go to hell. So the idea, the biblical idea of love is to rattle the cage, is to shake the boat, and to be the, to be the contentious one, you could say, the troublemakers. That's love. That's the loving thing to do. And to turn sinners away from wrath and judgment and say, look, go the other way. Go the other way. There's safety in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be safe from the wrath with just to come. So keep that in mind as well. This, this idea of loving one another, this is, this is a love that, that, is, that can be confrontational and can rebuke. You know, the loving thing to do sometimes, sometimes is harsh, stern, blunt rebuke. That's sometimes the most loving thing to do. Other times it's not. Other times it is appropriate to, to not cast your pearls before the swine. I don't want to neglect that either. Verse 13, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know, we certainly know that. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. 
This idea of love, as I mentioned, is there, but what's, what's specifically in view is, is a more narrow idea, and that's a love between God's people for each other. That's really what's in view. The, 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 um, one of the evidences of conversion, that you have, a, have an undying commitment to God's people. Verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay our lives down for the brethren. That's a great memory verse, by the way. Verse 17, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? There's another fruit of conversion. It's just generosity, Christian generosity, Christian selflessness. One of the, what was one of the defining, factor, defining attributes of the early church in Acts? was that they were known for living, and, and, and I've even mentioned, we don't have to necessarily go that far, but they were almost communally living in the sense of, if you needed something, everybody, uh, all, everybody's possessions, everybody who was a Christian was considered yours to, to come and to grab, as it were, if that was a need that needed to be met. And I think in a certain way, we need to be like that. There's a need that exists um, for one of us in the church here, but even in the universal church among Christians throughout the world, that need ought to be filled, stacked by God's people. Because God has, I mentioned this before, certainly blessed um, some of us with, with wealth and, and financial resources. And uh, they are there. You, you, if you're one of those people, you've been put by God in his providence here and in this place and at this time. And the people around you may need your help. You know, there's, we're not all called to give the same uh, portion financially. We're not. I don't believe necessarily in the 10% Old Testament. I know some people do. And... Um, I, I don't. I think it's a great rule to follow. I think it's a great idea. In fact, I do it. <laughs> I do the ten percent. But um, I don't think it's a law in the sense of every Christian has to do it. In fact, I think ten percent is kind of small. Really small. I mean, really, it's all you can give. I've heard of people giving ninety percent, living off ten. So, I say, you know, and, and that's what we find in the New Testament is not this idea of okay, what's the bare minimum I can give? It's how much can I give? And that's a whole other sermon <laughs> in and of itself. But. Um, But anyways, verse 18, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. There it is again. You know, what's, a, what's, a, what's another um, attribute of, an, uh, of a false convert? Oh, I love Christians. I love the church. I love to go to church. I love the pastor. Oh, yeah, do you? Let's look at your deeds. Let's look at your actions. Uh, my attendance is, is spotty at best and... I don't, I don't care to give. We can even use finance as an example. I don't care to give to the church. I don't care to support. I don't care to pray for my pastor. Whatever. I, I don't care to, to love the leadership of my local church or serve in another capacity. Whatever it is, th those, are, those are fruits of, of actual love for the brethren. Um, I think a good example, I was so encouraged this afternoon to talk to Miss Teresa and to learn about how she really has been a, a blessing to you all in, in putting together VBS uh, crafts and things like that. And even she mentioned at other events, She's a lot of times doing behind-the-scenes work. And I just thought, that's just such a mercy of God that she's here. And that she has been equipped by God in the way that she has to bless you all, to bless us uh, with, her, with her acts of service. And, and I'm grateful that she fulfills that role. But that shows what? It shows real love for the brethren. You know, things, things like that aren't necessarily easy. We know... Excuse me, we will know by this that we are of the truth and we and will assure our hearts before him. That's verse 19. Verse 20. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. A lot of that's already stuff we looked at, so I just read through it quick, quickly. But at the end there, that's really important. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, that's another set of evidences of conversion. The spirit of God, his presence in the life of the Christian. That's one of the, that's one of the, that's one of the fruits of salvation. And then we see that because in verse, or excuse me, in chapter 4, that theme is continued. It's, it's drawn out by Paul, or excuse me, by John. Chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 
By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming. And now it is already in the world. So we have these testing of various spirits. Basically what he's saying, and I, this, this would take a lengthy explanation to give you really the full context culturally what was going on in John's day. I mentioned last week about the Gnostics that had denied the, um, the bodily, um, the, the actual bodily existence of Jesus. They believed Jesus was merely a spiritual apparition. He was like a ghost. They didn't believe he had flesh and bones. That's heresy. We believe the word became what? Flesh. That's so important that we believe that. Christ physically, Jesus physically died. He physically shed his physical blood. His physical blood spilled onto the physical ground and he physically died. He physically cried out, it is finished and breathed his last. We, we know that. But the Gnostics actually denied that. They were a group of heretics in the early church. And um, so the apostle John warning the Christians about this group that's starting to rise up in the first century. And there was a lot of them. Um, and like I said, this is one of the things that, that was being brought to the attention of Christians was, do you believe Jesus really came in the flesh? I mean, is that necessary? Is it really? Because in the, in the mind of a Gnostic, they had a whole theology of everything that is, that is physical, everything that exists in the physical world is evil. It's, it, it, uh, it has a lot to do with um, Greek du uh, dualities. That uh, everything spiritual, everything that exists in the spiritual realm is good, and then everything that exists in the, in the physical world is evil. So Jesus could not have come into the flesh because it's evil, it's dirty, it's filthy, it's undefiled. Um, but we know that the scriptures never make such a distinction. Um, and the scripture even, especially in the Old Testament, talks about physical objects being holy. Um, Jesus' body was holy. And uh, Jesus shed his blood, his holy blood. So, um, and even, we know there's spiritual things that are evil. <laughs> So I'm sure we've, we've, we've witnessed those things, and the Scripture clearly testifies to that as well. So that's what he's getting at there with uh, testing the spirits. Really, what's in mind there is testing the teachers. You know, When I teach, guess what? I'm, I'm speaking in, um, by a spirit, not, uh, not a Pentecostal. I mean, what I mean by that is that uh, what I'm speaking from, the spirit of what? The spirit of God uh, from his word, or am I speaking from another spirit? And that's, that's what John has in view here is that, okay, if someone's speaking from another spirit, guess what's the sign? They're going to deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. But if they're speaking of the Holy Spirit, if they're speaking from the word of God, which the Holy Spirit um, inspired to be written, then what? They're going to confess that Jesus came into the fle in the flesh. Verse 4, you were from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. I think we see a theme here. We see a reoccurring theme. This is so important. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Uh, Mike and I were even talking this afternoon after church about um, a recent theological trend that's, that's, that's pretty big in America. And um, even in reform circles, it's pretty big. And I was telling Mike, one of the defining factors of a lot of the people in this particular movement is that they lack, they lack compassion. They like mercy. They like grace. They like love for people. They, they really loving people. And I, I don't mean in the sense of we, we have the bent naturally to love people who bring us benefit, who benefit us. You know, I mean, we even choose our spouses off of that basis. You know, whether we like their hair, we like their physical makeup, we like their personality, whatever it is, you know. And that, that's fine. That's a natural thing. But Scripture calls us to go so far beyond that. We ought to love people who when we love them, it, we get nothing in return. And that's unnatural. It's against the natural course of things. That's what the Bible is really talking about. And if we, brethren, if we were to be known in Ware Shoals, if this church needs, if this church wants a reputation in Ware Shoals that's remotely good, that's what we ought to be known for. That they say, when people think about Poplar Springs, they think, those people there, they, they love people in such a way that they don't expect and they don't want anything from those people. It's very, very difficult. That, that is an act of self-denial. It really is. We think about our Lord Jesus. Wow, nothing was in it for him. In, in the sense of um, nothing he could add to himself. He's fulfilled within himself. God is, God is self-sufficient. 
All that he needs is within himself. And in fact, even that's incorrect because God doesn't need anything. God, God, is, God is in himself light, life. He is, the, he is the very essence of existence. He is the very essence of reality. Everything is based off of him. And everything that, is in, that is, ha, has ever been even created, Scripture says, is, is merely upheld by the word of his power. And that's, that's incredible to think of who God is. So we think about Christ's condescension to save sinners and really, in the sense, there's nothing in it for him to add to his person other than he does bring himself great glory in doing that and shows and puts his power and his, his majesty on display. And we likewise ought to be like that. That it's not, there's nothing in it for us. That speaking of our love for the brethren, but also even love for the world. We can expand this out further. Love for unbelievers, love for family, love for our wives, or for you women, for your husbands. These things, you, you can apply it to any sort of relation you want. All these are evidences of true salvation. Because this kind of love, like I mentioned, is what? It's against nature. You wouldn't do it normally. Verse 9. Excuse me, verse 8. But the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And there it is, just like I mentioned. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiate means wrath has been absorbed. It means to appease wrath. Christ was our, our wrath absorber. He was our sponge to soak up God's justice and God's holy indignation against our sin. And there's not a drop uh, that is left for us. That's the essence of love. And so in light of that, uh, John says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we, ought, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we, are, that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. We have come to know and I believe the love which God has for us. You know, there's a real sense. And you, you guys know I'm not a big fan of like this frou-frou. You know, God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life kind of preaching. But there's a real sense in which we ought to exalt the love of God. The, 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 the love, the, the agape love of God. It's so beautiful. In fact, I love one of my favorite songs that's not a hymn. And that's rare. I don't really like many songs outside of hymns and psalms is a song, by, a song called The Love of God. And I love when it's sang by the Gaithers. The, I think they get like uh, David Phelps, a couple other people singing on YouTube and listen to the, the video. And uh, I, actually, I think it is a hymn. I'm, I'm losing my mind. I'm sorry. It shows my, infallibil or shows my fallibility. Um, it is a hymn. That's right. It's a cover of a hymn. Well, who knew? Um, but regardless, a beautiful hymn, and it describes the love of God as being so... Uh, so infinite. So, and, and, and we see it like in the Baptist Catechism, for example, it says God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And I, I say it's the same for his love. His love is an infinite love. It will never end. It will be that love that we are kept in for all eternity. And scripture even describes it uh, in this way. It says uh, when we're saved, what is shed abroad in our hearts? Is it the peace of God? No, it doesn't say that. Is it the mercy of God? No, it says the love of God is what is shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit whom He has given us. That's in Romans 8. You can see here, the love is this, is this very key attribute, this very key virtue. It's the, it's the crown jewel of all Christian virtue. It is. It's the, it's the Mount Everest of every, every Christian ethic, love. And it fuels all that we do. Love for God and love for fellow man. That's why Jesus could summarize the whole law in love for God and love for your neighbor. I think, I, I don't know if I read verse 14, but he says, We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and I believe the love which God has for us. God is love and the one who abides in him, or excuse me, abides in love, abides in God and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, 
And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. This is verse 19. That's, a, that's, a good, that's another good memory verse. It's super easy to remember. Super, super easy. You can remember it in five minutes. We love because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 19. That's where it comes from. It doesn't stem from ourselves. It's, it's from God. It originates in Him. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from Him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. This is very redundant. We look at it and we're like, man, okay, we get it. We do get it. We get it. But he's, He wants to labor. He really wants us to get this. He's like, drill it into your head. If, you, if you're not going to get it the first time or the eighth time, I'll say it, the t- I'll say it till the tenth time until you get it. This is very basic. But we do need to hear it. We do need to hear it. Told to us multiple times. Chapter 5. And he brings it, starts to bring it to a close here. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the, the Christ, my, my translation says the Christ, is born of God and whoever loves the Father... Loves a child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments. Now listen to this. Are not burdensome. I mentioned uh, Martin Luther. You know, you have, you have him who, who looks at the law of God and, and, and any sort of Christian activity as a burden because he looks at it like the way of salvation. Those things are the way in which he'll be saved. That would cause anyone to be burdened. But rather we see, no, we are saved. Because Christ fulfilled those laws on our behalf. And his righteousness is given to us. And God sees us perfect in him. And now in light of that, and now in light of the fact that God has given us a new heart, that we long for what he longs for. And we we love what he loves. We delight in what God delights in. Do we look at his law and say, yes, it is not a burden. It is a delight. And I I, I sat in Travis's class two weeks ago, I think it was. And um, had a wonderful time in Sunday school. I guess it was last week. My apologies. But... um, in there, and we were discussing the law of God, and we listened to a teaching on the law of God. And I was just thinking, oh man, Psalm 19, that's a beautiful song. You know, oh, how I love your law. May that be the cry of all of our hearts. May that be the cry. And that is the cry of the regenerate heart. When they behold the law of God, they say, I love it. I love it. I love to pursue the fulfillment of it in my life, that I put these things into practice. Verse 4, for whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that we have, uh, that, that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith, you know, what, what do we hear again in some fruit free circles we hear? You're an overcomer. You know, your faith is strong, you're powerful. We're weak. Our faith is weak. Our strength is very little. But our God is a strong God. And we know from Philippians 1.6, God is who carries us to the end. And so that's really what John's saying here. We're gonna, we, we are going to overcome the world because God has given us and God supplies and still strengthens this faith in us. And, is, and enables us by His grace to believe Him. And so we will overcome the world. Verse 5, Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water. And by blood, or in, by, in blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Some of your Bibles, uh, if you use King James or the New King James, they probably have this. Uh, there's going to be a verse there that you may think I, I skipped, and that's because it's not there in the New American Standard Translation. And that's a whole other issue and a whole other topic. But uh, suffice it to say that there is some doubt as to whether uh, 1 John, I think it's, what is that, 5, 7, the full, the entirety of 1 John 5, or excuse me, of verse 8. And my translation is, is added to verse 8, but it's either verse 7 or verse 8, sometimes in between there. There's some doubt as to whether that's there in the original. Um, it's not a deal breaker because it's not a doctrine. It, it, it's, uh, I think the, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the King James puts it the, um, what is it, the Father, the Son, maybe your translation has it, I'm sure you'll know, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit testify. And so it's a Trinitarian verse. It talks about the Trinity being in agreement. And we see that that gives evidence to the fact that God is triune. Um, however, that's not the only place in the Bible the Trinity is referenced. So we, we ought not get all too concerned with, well, was this there, was it not? Some of us may say, yeah, I believe it was there. I'm convinced it was there in the original. And then other godly Christians have said, I'm convinced it wasn't. 
It's not a deal breaker because elsewhere in Scripture, the same exact thing is said multiple times in both Testaments and in multiple books by multiple authors. So um, the fact that it's not here or is here isn't, isn't mission critical to the doctrine of the Trinity. So keep that in mind. Um, and this is, this is an aspect where um, Bible translations and, and uh, how we got our English Bible, it's important that we understand those things. And I wish I could go into a little bit more in-depth um, but, but suffice it to say, don't let something like that induce doubt in the Word of God because, in fact, we have – the Bible is the most trusted piece of ancient literature in the history of the world. In fact, uh, I mean incredibly, incredibly trusted, really, really. So don't, uh, don't think that that's, uh, that's a cause for, uh, for us to be upset as it were to be shaken. In fact, uh, there's a great um, teaching by a man named Dr. James White – on the reliability of the New Testament on YouTube. And it's like an hour and 45 minute long teaching. And he's, he has, he's very brilliant. I mean, he has three times more degrees than I do. So, um, and he, he's taught Greek, Hebrew, church history. Smart guy. Knows the subject more exhaustively than I do. I mean, the guy can sight read Greek. He can sight read Greek. That's, that's not just translating. That's, you can read and in real time say what you're reading in English. So the guy knows his Greek New Testament. We'll say that much. He knows his Greek Bible. And uh, the teaching's great. And it explains using statistics, using numbers. It's not just, it's not just a, 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 um, an objective Bible teaching. It is. He uses scripture. But it's, it's also getting down to the facts of, of how we got our Bible today. And I can say it, we can have the utmost confidence in its reliability. In its reliability. So um, keep that in mind. In verse 9, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his Son. In Christ's coming, God gave testimony concerning him. God gave, and even we see it in the inspiration and the writing of Scripture. The one who believes in the Son of God has a testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. What he's saying is this. If you reject Christ, you are calling and you are telling God what? You are a liar. So that's an offense. That's why it's so important that people confess and, and turn and believe upon Christ. Verse 11 in the testimony of, uh, is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has a son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. Verse 13, these things I have written to you. We saw this, we read this last week. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from Him. If anyone, and uh, this is an interesting portion, I won't go into exp explaining this. It's, uh, it's highly contested as to the meaning of this. He says in verse 16, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask God and God, or excuse, he shall ask and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not leading to death. Verse 18, we know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, he says, this is the true God and eternal life. Christ is deity. Christ is God. He is the, the, the eternal God. And then verse 21, he closes <laughs> with a really interesting verse because it just comes out of nowhere. It just kind of pops out. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Idols. And I, there's certainly something to be said about that as Christians. There's a battle raging um, concerning idolatry all the time in us. And we all have that bent. To make something out to be an idol. And it's, it's wise that we as Christians scrutinize ourselves and ex examine ourselves. What is that? Uh, what are those things that I have a bent toward to make an idol? And be on guard against those. Those, those are going to be your most deadly enemies. Um, and, uh, and you will do well. Guard yourself from idols and you will do well, certainly. So that closes the book of John, uh, the book of 1 John, John's first epistle. He wrote two others. 
And it was funny, uh, 2 John, I actually, was it 2 John? Yeah, my siblings and I memorized the whole book of 2 John. Because it's only, it's only 13 verses, so it's just like a, it's like a point. But it was a fun little, it was a fun little project we did together. And, um, but 2 John and 3 John don't really say much doctrinally. They're actually really personal letters, really, really personal. But uh, a lot of what is said there, it actually just calls back to 1 John. A lot of it's just repeating that. So, anyways, um, but yeah, that's true and false conversion. That, that's, that's, uh, that's what the Bible, uh, or the, the specific book of the Bible dedicated to this subject has to say concerning these things. At least the last three chapters of it. I'm surprised we made it through that in the time that God, uh, or the time that we've been appointed to. And I'm grateful. Next week, we're doing our evangelism training. So um, bring yourselves, I would say bring a notebook. Uh, if, you, if you're a big note, I'm not a note taker at all. Never take notes at anything. I just cannot stand it. It just drives me crazy. It distracts me. I, if, I, if, if I need to, I'll remember it. You know? uh, and it's just, some people can work like that. Some people can't. But uh, if you're a note taker, bring, bring a notepad. We're going to be handing out uh, like an outline of what I'm going to be teaching. It's going to be really... It's going to be really different. It's not going to be more preaching, more just teaching. And then I'm even going to do it in such a way, hopefully, that you have the freedom and you feel free enough to interrupt me with questions as we go along. Because that's really, it's a conversation is what this is going to be, a corporate conversation about the, the subject of evangelism. Because, again, I just want to equip you all and train you all and, and, and give you some of the things I know and some of the things I've learned, some things I've learned the hard way um, about sharing the gospel. And um, so be prepared, be excited. It'll be a good time. It'll be very interesting. And even Travis is going to teach one week on open air preaching. He's going to give a biblical case for open air preaching. So I'm really excited to see what he does with that. And um, that'll be good. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close out our time together this evening. Oh, Father, we're thankful. We're thankful for your word. I, I just, I think about your son as the scriptures here clearly testify to that he came into the world. He appeared to deal with sin in his first advent. And he did it out of love. He loved. He was so compassionate, so merciful. He, people were struck. Those prostitutes, those, those, those tax collectors, those sinners were struck by the mercy, the grace, and the love of Christ. And even the apostles, John wrote in the Gospel of John, he said, um, And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh God, may that be what people see in us. They, they walk away saying they are full of grace and they're full of truth. That that, that, that Lord whom they follow, he is, a, he is a great Lord. He has done a work in them. They are different. They are different. And Father, I pray that uh, we would be diligent to examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. To, to, to get the scalpel of your word, Father, and cut away the layers and see and examine the inner man and see uh, it, and do we remain unchanged? Do we remain in our sins or are we yours? And Father, I know that if we are, that it will be manifest, it will be clear by our works. For our Lord said, it is by your fruits that you shall know them. So we rejoice, Father. We rejoice knowing that you have ordered all this to be objective, not by feelings, not by whimsical um, emotions, as it were. I know that my emotions go up and down often. I'm grateful that my faith isn't connected to those things and doesn't hinge upon those things. Father, I pray that we would be increased, our faith would be increased as a result of these things this evening. And that we would have a restful evening preparing for a week of work. But maybe remember that that work is itself a ministry unto you and is to be done with diligence to your glory. So that the world again sees that we are from you and not of it. We thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Thank you. Cheat sheet is such a blessing. It really is. Well, um, do I need to open up in prayer? Last week we didn't. You just prayed. I just prayed. Okay, <laughs> there we go. There we go. So, ask. For, oh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to read it like that. <laughs> we, will be, we will begin with the reading of the minutes. We'll begin. Sunday evening, September 23rd, 2018, regular church conference was held at the end of the evening worship service. The meeting was called to order and opened in prayer by the moderator, Pastor Lucas Mann. The minutes from the last conference were read and approved. The treasurer's tabulation for August was approved as printed in the popular corners. There being no business, conference was adjourned and closed in prayer by Lucas Mann. Sunday, October 14th, 2018, at the end of the morning worship service, the doors of the church were opened and we had come on promise of letter, Lucas Mann, from First Baptist Church of Cross Hill. Special church conference was called by 
called to order by the moderator, Travis Gosling, for the purpose of presenting Lucas Mann as a con candidate for membership. Motion was seconded and approved. Special church conference was adjourned. You better write down who, who, didn't, do, who didn't agree. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. That's it. Thank you very much. I greatly appreciate that. That was an eloquent reading of the, of the minutes. It certainly was. Are there any changes to the minutes? Any changes? All right. Do we have an emotion? Do we have a motion? Do we have emotion? Do we have emotions right now in this room? <laughs> Do we have a motion to accept the minutes as read? Motion. All right. He has emotions. All right. Seven. All right. All those in favor of accepting the minutes as read, please raise your hands. All right. Do we have a motion to accept the treasures? Tabulation is printed in the popular poplar pointers. Excuse me. Make a motion. Do we have a second? Okay. All those in favor of accepting the treasurer's tabulation, please raise your hands. Okay. Is there any old business? Is there any new business? Yes. We have the request for the letter of James Donnan Culbertson, who has united with, let's see, what church is this? Windsor Park Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. It's a little ways away. <laughs> what do we do with that? Have we have a vote. Mo Just yeah, a motion. second. We have a motion that's, for that? That's a motion. Okay, second? Second. All right. All in favor? Okay. Anybody know him? You remember him? Anybody know him? Miss Jean knows him. You know him. There you go. What is he? 84 years old. 84. What 84 year old doing? What's he moving out of Texas for? He's been there. He's been out there. He's been there. Years. <laughs> now, let me just reach out to my church I haven't been to in four decades, real quick. Let me get my. <laughs> All right, then. Um, Yeah, I think so. We're all this. Does anyone want to make a motion that we adjourn? Make a motion. Do we have a second? Okay. okay, all those in favor, please stand for a closing and prayer. And we'll make it brief because we already prayed. Let's pray. Father, we pray now as we separate that we are blessed, that we are protected, and as I mentioned earlier, that we are given a restful evening. And ultimately, that we are given spiritual rest as we look to Christ, who himself is our Sabbath. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.